if we have, yeah, just for our future reference, I am going to record this session. Um, so hopefully um, we all make it to 2022 and um, let's hope that world gets over this COVID situation sooner. Um, so without any further ado, I would like to start with this uh, presentation where the agenda is going to be, um, what are the, what has changed if you are coming back to testing after a long, long time, or maybe after um, two, three years. I mean, things are changing in software industry very fast. Uh, it can be as um, soon as in a month, you will have four or five releases of a software package you have been using. So we would like to understand what has changed. Would like to understand what is going to change in future, how the future path looks like, um, most of the times when we are engrossed into our day-to-day -day lives, sometimes we lose, um, I mean, we lose the focus of the future and what we should be really, um, you know, focusing on the trends. We don't read much and then we lose the focus. And then we are going to talk about how can I be ready for that change, right? Whatever is coming next, how can I be ready? So um, first things first, what has changed in software industry is the approach of testing, right? A lot of people have been doing traditional testing, writing test cases, um, executing test cases, reporting defects, and getting the builds after the fact, right? I mean, you know, in traditional waterfall model, we have been following um, requirement analysis, um, design, coding, then testing phase, then um, implementation. Um, lately, as um, Agile and uh, Scrum has picked up, a lot of that has changed. So as the um, product companies want to put their product into production as fast as they can, they need speed. And for that speed, they want to roll out features into production as soon as in hours or at least bi-weekly when their sprint finishes. So with that, there has been a lot of change in the way we are testing. So you know the cost of quality increases as we shift our focus or shift the testing later in the stage, right? If we don't find something in requirement stage, it goes into design, percolates down to code, test, release, and maybe find uh, found in support. But what has changed in um, testing now, lot, lot more companies and people have started looking back at their testing strategy and shifting their testing early on. How do they do that? By investing a lot of time, money, and resources into earlier testing life cycles. For example, in requirement analysis, design, code, and test. So your defect count really has to be, um, you know, number of defects found or um, number of defects prevented should be done in the earlier stages like requirement design and code. How that is done is by including QA in every um, phase of software development. Earlier, um, the focus was only getting the testing done in the testing phase, but nowadays uh, in sprint planning meeting, grooming meetings, day-to-day um, communication with the team, everybody involves testing team because they are going to be responsible for ultimate quality. Nowadays, the um, that statement has also been um, changed a lot. People are starting look, start, started looking at uh, tester or QA team as part of the team rather than being a separate team. So shift left Particularly in our uh, testing context, what has happened is we have started looking at, uh, rather than just looking at UI, we have started looking at API test and also started looking at unit test as well. So testers and test automation engineers are now being part of the pull request review or a code review of the developers and um, if they have implemented CICD or um, um, the code coverage monitoring tools 
uh, some teams are also making QA team responsible for checking the dashboards of quality and um, telling the developers your code coverage is, let's say, not 85% or 90%, uh, whichever is the standard they have defined. So this change has um, um, actually put a stress on a testers' capability to understand what is going on in overall development lifecycle rather than just sitting ducks and waiting for their build, right? So they are now testers are expected to understand all the architectures, um, infrastructure, how it is being deployed, and then get involved in every step to review the requirements, to review the designs, how the things work together, to review the code as well. So this is the shift left model, uh, which is being um, used in a lot of uh, companies right now. This is the current state of testing as far as our approach is concerned. Now let's look at um, how our testing artifacts are uh, impacted. So if you look at, um, let's say test cases, Test cases were traditionally written in Excel sheet or you know, test rail or um, quality center or any other favorite tool, whether we had test case ID, we had title, prerequisite, lengthy steps, expected result, actual result, uh, pass fail, defect ID. I mean, there are witnesses here, Jason, me, Charles, we're writing many, many test cases in Excel sheet um, and uh, using that for execution as well, right? So now things have changed a lot. People have started looking at their investment into test case design and whether it really makes sense for you to write these elaborate um, test cases uh, with descriptions of title, prerequisite steps, expected result, most of the times in my experience, we have not looked at that test case report other than the dashboard, right? How many number of test cases passed, failed, and how many test cases um, were not executed? So other than that numbers, people are, I mean, my leaders or uh, huh? were not uh, interested in uh, um, actually understanding what is inside the test case report, what has gone in there. Right, so the coverage uh, was assessed by traceability matrix where the requirements were mapped to the test cases and there were test case numbers written there. Nowadays, things have changed drastically. People have started looking at new avenues, new tools, more visual tools who understand their test coverage and write their test cases as well. So um, there has been change people have started looking at test cases in this context. This is a mind map, uh, forget about this X mind trial mode, but the mind map have been, um, I mean, this these existed like 40, 50 years back as well. Mind map primarily is, is used in um, learning, understanding, brainstorming, um, and creating more and more ideas. But in context of uh, testing, uh, mind maps are adopted in testing for creating more and more test cases, uh, laying out the um, requirements um, in a more visual way for you to understand what is the coverage of your uh, requirements and test cases. For example, in this mind map, we are looking at a payroll system where there are a lot of features articulated as um, edges of that mind map. Um, and uh, basically you can look at every feature and then you can test every feature and you can write your test cases into uh, this mind map by saying that I have tested basic, positive, negative. If it is a number, you can add test cases for uh, uh, characters, alphanumeric, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this has changed um, um, the way we look at the um, way we write test cases. Um, this tool is not only used for um, writing test cases or devising test cases, it is also used for categorization of test cases. 
Categorization, you mean if I have to mark any particular test case as a smoke test or regression test, you have opportunity to do that by just adding annotation here, right? So you can use the same mind map as a stencil to um, add annotations for whether this test case is a smoke test, regression test, positive test, or negative test. Um, there are a lot of people using this tool nowadays to just, I not write any manual test cases, uh, to tell you frankly, as more and more focuses on right, uh, rather than writing those test cases, devising most more test cases and using the time saved into creating more and more test cases. Why would you spend your time in writing your test case if it can be depicted in your mind map clearly? And that time saved you can uh, use in thinking about writing, I mean, devising or designing new test cases. So this is what is changed in test cases. There is also another way of uh, writing test cases nowadays because most of the teams have moved on uh, to test automation. People have started acknowledging um, the use of um, BDD or Gherkin for writing test cases. So Gherkin is used for um, um, writing uh, test cases in given when then format. It is very um, simplistic uh, way or writing your test cases in natural language. And you can reuse Gherkin steps once you have written it. If you are writing in any, um, let's say IDE like IntelliJ, Eclipse or any other IDE, the, uh, when you start typing, it will automatically give you suggestions on which step you can reuse. Uh, it can be used for API automation, UI automation, or even if you are not doing automation, if you write a simple step, it can be reused or suggested uh, for you to write that step, right? Um, as I mean, BDD, mostly behavior-driven development is focused on behavior of the user. Um, and hence it is, uh, it is very obvious that in uh, Agile or uh, Scrum teams where a product owner is describing the behavior or the feature that is being created, um, developers, product owner, tester, um, and anybody who's involved into uh, creating that feature sits together, understand what is the acceptance criteria, write, sit down in very simple natural language. As a user, I would like to have a calculator which does the basic operation. And then tester asks questions, what kind of operations are there going to be? And then uh, product owner would uh, say, yeah, there would be addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc." So they start writing their scenario or scenario outlines. So scenarios are then written in given when then format, given is your prerequisite, when is your action, and then is your um, result. So as it is articul articulated here, given I am on calculator homepage, when I enter, let's say number one in calculator and I place operator and I enter second, um, number in the calculator, then I see the result. This test case, if automated, can be executed more efficiently. And you can also read that because, and this ser serves as a purpose of documenting your feature, right? You would read this feature file and scenarios um, more enthusiastically rather than looking at the earlier Excel sheet based test cases that you, you were looking at. This approach is picking up because it is very, um, um, it is, um, you know, encouraging the collaboration in Scrum teams. And that's why BDD or Cucumber based or SpecFlow based automation fr frameworks are flourishing right now. You would hardly hear anybody talking about just test NG based um, automation frameworks. Um, because it also provides one more layer of reusability into your um, automation framework. Uh, once you start using it, you will start loving it and you would not uh, write your test case in any other format. 
area. Uh, in test automation as well, uh, if you can see um, in the world that we live, uh, there is uh, inverted test pyramid and practical test pyramid. This practical test pyramid uh, concept was uh, coined by Martin Flower, um, uh, a very good tester and architect who has been a thought leader into, um, ex into uh, expedited quality, quality assurance, um, microservices architecture, etc. So what you're looking at um, on the left hand side is ice cream cone pyramid. That's what we typically build when we start testing or test automation. Most of the teams are in very much hurry to just create that feature and then they uh, um, focus on manual testing. Right? That's what this ice cream is at the top, right? They also focus on UI automation as they progress and create more and more um, Test, they want to automate, let's say, their smoke test or regression test. And then they create a lot of UI tests, uh, which are expensive to automate and um, are slower. Because um, if you have used Selenium for uh, maybe even if it is for a month, you would understand why they are slow because you put a lot of weight because your website um, is not responsive. Um, then suddenly they realize, oh, we have APIs as well. So why not do API testing as well? Uh, your um, product owner or um, architect actually insists that as we are using microservices architecture, why don't you use API? Um, and then um, they also start putting together some unit tests. So actually it goes in the reverse way. Even though sometimes it is parallel as you write your code a uh, developer also writes some unit test. Um, as the APIs are created, there are um, API tests or survey test, service tests created, but the more emphasis is given on automated GUI or UI test. And that is called anti-pattern because you spend a lot of time in automating the UI, which will eventually change, right? After six months or a year, your um, business uh, actually decides to change the way it looks. I don't like it. So let's just get into ReactJS, AngularJS and change the UI because it was in uh, legacy architecture. So you are, your UI is gone. You will have to rewrite all those test cases or most probably if you have used BDD approach, probably you'll have to just change your um, element identifiers if you understand what I mean in terms of um, automation. But when you automate your API tests, they last longer because what is going to change is just the contract. You can add maybe one or two fields or change the field types from, let's say, integer to float or whatnot, right? In that case, your reusability of test would still be there. As you create more and more microservices, it is very important to create more and more API tests and contract test, endpoint test and contract test, because you want to test that if my uh, API is being uh, used as a provider or a um, provider, then uh, the contracts are not broken. Similarly, now the focus has shifted from doing a lot of UI, GUI test. Why not just do your unit test better? More and more teams in Agile and Scrum are now focusing on uh, unit test coverage. Uh, sometimes they put their unit test coverage as 85, 90% as a success criteria for their teams. So you have uh, your uh, um, user story success criteria or acceptance criteria. You also have, um, um, when should I say that my sprint is done? So definition of done, for the sprint is all my test cases, uh, unit test cases are done for all the stories that I have done and all of them are passing more than 90% of uh, code with 90% plus code coverage. So there are tools to measure the code coverage, the code that you have written. If it is passing more than 90%, only then your pull request will be created. So those kind of quality gates are getting there. The And as I mentioned, um, Unit tests are cheaper to write and they are faster. If you execute unit test, 100 unit test, 
I'm sure they will get executed in less than uh, two minutes. But if you execute selenium based test cases, every test is going to be at least 30 seconds to one and a half minute long, depending on how um, slow or fast your application is. And your API tests are in between. They are um, not very expensive, not very slow as UI test, but uh, they are a little slower than um, unit test. So this is the change in approach of test automation. A lot more and more are people who are moving from the ice cream cone inverted test pyramid to practical test pyramid. And now DevOps, right? So if you have to, uh, if you have created a lot of your unit test, your um, API test, and your UI test as well, it is very, um, I mean, uh, obvious that you are going to execute those test cases for every code change. <clears throat> and the best way to do that is into your CI CD or DevOps implementation. Uh, if you want to uh, put any, <coughs> excuse me, code into um, production faster, it is very obvious that you will implement um, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline. There are a lot of terms nowadays coined. Um, there is DevOps, there is uh, DevSecOps, DevQAOps, and whatnot. But um, what it translates to is this. So you develop your code in your IDE. Uh, you check that in uh, any of your favorite version control system. Uh, as soon as you check that in, I mean, you obviously would do some um, uh, code review. Um, that is included in this version control. You would do some build, uh, which is uh, using Jenkins, Azure Pipeline, or Gradle Land, Grunt. Uh, there are so many tools out there. Most used uh, is Jenkins because of its popularity. Um, nowadays, uh, GitHub and GitLab also has YAML-based pipeline uh, mechanism that you can build into code itself. So infrastructure as a code or um, is picking up very faster and hence the this uh, picture is also getting more and more uh, it changing uh, faster. So um, then you can run your unit test whether they are written in test ng, j unit, ms test be depending on whatever your technology is. And there are code quality coverage uh, tools um, available for checking after executing those uh, tests. What is the code coverage? There are uh, tools like SonarCube or Clover who can give you the percentage of test cases uh, executed at the same time, what amount of code it has covered in that um, execution. Then uh, once your code coverage is done, um, we can um, actually deploy it. And in deployment also, there has been huge change in the way uh, applications are deployed. Um, earlier, there is to be servers which um, actually um, be hosting applications. Um, there would be backend server, database server, UI server. But nowadays everything is, and that could be on-premise, but everybody is moving to cloud, whether it is AWS, Azure, uh, Google Cloud, whatnot. Um, and things are being deployed in containers. More and more teams are um, adopting Docker as their go-to strategy for uh, containerizing using Kubernetes to deploy them across the cluster of AWS, um, Azure Cloud, or Google Cloud. Um, so as there is more and more adoption to the cloud, the deployment has also been, um, I mean, revamped very drastically. Um, when we speak about deployment, after deployment, if you are using microservices or there are any APIs, it is obvious that you will run in uh, your test cases. Um, so you run your API test first because you want early um, failure warnings that your uh, microservice or APIs are not working. Uh, then you can uh, 
either run your UI test, which are Selenium based test or Cypress based test or Catalon, HP, UFT. There are so many tools other than Selenium um, to run your, uh, I mean, create your automated test and run them. And there are also um, continuous performance testing um, terms are being coined now where you create your um, performance test and put them in the uh, load test, uh, I mean, uh, CI CD pipeline to run your load test after several um, check ins are happening. So maybe nightly you run your load test, not after every check in, I would say. And then there are uh, some monitoring tools, um, tools like Splunk, Nagios. Uh, Dynatress, App Dynamics. This actually continuously monitor your uh, servers in and their logs whether there are any failures. If there are failures, they report back. There are some intelligent mechanisms nowadays uh, where uh, if the server goes down, it automatically brings up. In that cluster, the um, uh, the, the particular node is uh, removed and a new node is created and it will start automatically serving your requests. So those kind of intelligent, artificial intelligence is involved in nowadays into uh, infrastructure management that will automatically serve your customers. And this, all of this is DevOps. You can include security layer as well in between. Um, so after your code is deployed, there could be a, another node here to run your automated scans. Uh, tools like um, um, Zap Proxy, uh, which is free tool, can be used for active or passive scans of your application so that it can give you automated alerts that in this particular check-in, we have been, um, added uh, two more vulnerabilities and that need to be fixed. So security is also getting involved and that's where people are calling it DevSecOps. There are a lot of things changing and people want to uh, get early alerts um, uh, so that they can fix it faster, right? So um, to be successful, the mantra is you fail fast. And once you fail fast, you get uh, faster feedback, right? So this is what is changing and the way we were building and um, deploying the application and testing. So um, all of that is being changed by this continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous testing. Let's look at um, some industry trends <clears throat> now. Um, uh, we know that internet of things um, has been there since last uh, decade or so, but um, uh, IoT research is estimated to rise its uh, market size to 3624.23 billion. USD by 2025. We already have a lot of cars like Tesla is uh, an example of IoT, which runs um, on the um, technology which can be controlled remotely, right? Um, there are so many devices, whether it is farm equipments or industry equipment being utilized and controlled remotely. Uh, and they interact with each, each other. So this IoT industry is going to um, uh, have a lot of impact on um, industry progress, um, and this is going to grow um, very fast. Uh, mobile app, uh, mobile apps, global mat, uh, market size was valued at uh, USD 106.27 billion in 2018. And it, it is estimated to hit 407.31 billion by the year 2016, uh, 26. Uh, you can see that everybody is um, nowadays uh, into their um, mobile more than they are um, into their families. I and mean, they don't even speak to each other nowadays. Uh, even if you are, uh, you want to check whether uh, dinner is ready, you kind of text whether it is ready and then you get up from your um, uh, desk. Um, security is going to be um, a prime um, concern because there are more and more um, vulnerabilities being incorporated into architecture itself. 
as people are more cautious about their uh, data privacy or security cyber security spending is going to increase um, and you will see that by 2022 will exceed usd uh, 1337 billion right and this is a usd figures just imagine how much time money and resources is being spent on cyber security and this is not only uh, just security testing maybe i didn't uh, quote it correctly but uh, this is about uh, investment that is spent in building the infrastructure assessing the vulnerabilities fixing them as well and blockchain is another um, trend that has been there you, you have seen lot of um, media news nowadays about uh, bitcoin and doge coin and lot of those coins um, uh, which are um, service through this blockchain uh, technology and global blockchain market is expected to cross uh, 39.7 billion dollars by end of year 2025 so it is relevant uh, relative to 3 billion dollars in 2020 so you can see the progress that is being made in blockchain uh, if um, uh, visionaries like uh, elon musk is counting on that if he is accepting uh, bitcoin as a, as a you know instead of dollars for um, tesla imagine what could happen if everybody starts um, uh, buying stuff using bitcoin right so there would be huge uh, impetus to the blockchain technology and people would be creating more and more um, blockchain applications uh, there are a lot of uh, people investing their time and money in understanding how they can apply blockchain technology in various other sectors as well including like say uh voting systems for example can be a um, a prime example of how blockchain can be used in voting system there are some of my friends are working in the uh, voting system um, industry uh, where they can create a blockchain based voting system there are various other use cases as well they, those are coming up uh, as far as blockchain is concerned cloud infrastructure um, as we discussed about aws uh, google cloud uh, azure devops uh, by 2023 40% of all enterprises workload will be deployed in cloud infrastructure and platform services up to 20% by 2020 um, uh, up from 20% in 2020 so it is going to double in about 2 years i already see lot of my clients moving from um buying a rack space or um, server to using aws or um, google cloud because it is so easy to provision it and then people are using it for deployment very easy to provision the uh, ease of use has uh, skyrocketed this cloud infrastructure um, spending i would say so these are some of the industry trends but um, i am um, going to give you some eye opener in next slide which is going to be um, i mean you will surprise you will be surprised to see that so something called hyper automation um, term is being called coined in last one year or so and it is combination of uh, robotic process automation artificial intelligence and machine learning you might be wondering why didn't i use artificial intelligence and machine learning in earlier slide because that is going to be uh, that is there since last 5 6 or 7 years and it is changing world very drastically people are talking about a um, lot of use cases which they have implemented or are going to use so what is this 25% um number mean to you the 25% is the task by uh, which are going to be autonomously done by machines using artificial intelligence machine learning and process mining so industry by 20, 2023 this is gartner's 
um, projection about using artificial intelligence. Lot of lot of um, technology manufacturing um, uh, companies are going to implement uh, automation in such a scale that it is going to work. Um, it is going to have autonomous machineries doing 25% of the work. So 25% of the workforce, it goes out of job in as soon as 2023, whatever you wanna do. By 2025, we're going to have, if you are going to order a product, the first person to touch that product is going to be you. Everything else will be done by machines. So more than 20% of the goods will be made, packaged, transported, delivered without any external touch. Imagine how revolutionary is that? And then where goes that 20% manpower or man force, right? So we're displacing that workforce somewhere, but that does not mean that everybody will be out of job. There are things that we can do that machines cannot do or cannot, artificial intelligence has not grown enough to do that. So what can we expect in trends? You have seen a lot of industry trends. So what can we expect uh, as far as testing is concerned? Where will we go? So as you can see, mobile app testing is going to grow. Um, in previous slide, you have seen the numbers. Blockchain testing is going to um, be trending. You are going to have a lot of security testing, vulnerability assessment and cybersecurity advisors uh, being hired. You're going to see a lot of momentum on IoT testing. You're going to see a lot of cloud-based testing. Um, now as well, when you want to run your cross-browser testing, nobody wants to buy devices, right? Um, we use uh, tools like uh, Lambda Test, Browser Stack, or Source Labs to serve our customers. Right? We are a testing-only company. We don't. We can't buy uh, every device that is asked by client that we want to uh, get our application testing on this. So, a lot of emphasis on will be on cloud-based testing. Then there are some new entrants here: autonomous test automation. Nowadays, there are uh, tools like TestCraft, TestIM, TestIO, Test.io. Uh, these people have started devising an autonomous test authoring process. You don't have to even identify the objects, right? It will do it on its own and create the test cases. You just have to do maybe record and playback once, and then it will do it for you. Or codeless testing tools. Um, I have a friend in this code, um, codeless development and codeless testing. There are record playbacks tools, uh, which we have seen in um, 80s, 90s, or early 2000s. We have seen a lot of record playback tools. Uh, those are coming back because there has to be early adoption of testing, and that's why they are coming back. Codeless development, codeless automation is also picking up because people want to move faster. Understand that the speed is the key. If uh, you have the same idea as your um, some other person, and if you go to market fast, you are going to reap benefits of being fast, uh, being first there in the market. So how can you be ready for all of this? Now that you have seen all the changes, those are there already or are going to happen, what can you do? So first advice that I would have is learn test automation. It is not that hard. If you have not done earlier, you can, I mean, there are tremendous amount of knowledge available on internet right now. You can just search for a keyword and you will have millions of blogs, videos, Udemy courses, and whatnot, YouTube courses uh, for learning anything. So test automation is not that hard. If you are not a software engineer, that doesn't matter. You can learn any skill, um, start learning coding, even if it is in smaller portions, learn to code and continue to practice every day. That is our advice on um, learning then learn about these new 
technologies what is iot what is blockchain and keep an eye on industry trends am i losing my mind am i looking at uh, what artificial intelligence uh, is doing what are the applications of artificial intelligence so keep reading so if you are not reading and keeping yourself up to date every day then you are losing uh, focus of where the industry is going you will not be um, up to date um, and be hireable right then learn to use cloud based test uh, infrastructure for manual or automated test as you are in testing or want to be in testing it is very important for you to understand what are those uh, tools doing and how they are doing it for example if you want to test any website on um let's say safari browser and you don't have it what do you do um, borrow a macbook from your friend try not doing that instead uh, enroll to browser stack or lambda test it is um, there are freemium products available Uh, plans available you can just enroll for free and check what browsers are available under free and use their services to test at least try to uh, understand how the tests are done on those cloud infrastructure manually or through automation if you have learned automation already um, just do not use uh, i mean nowadays uh, nobody uses selenium grid i hope so if unless they uh, can't pay for browser stack or source labs or um, lambda test but um, try not to create your own infrastructure because uh, maintaining it will be lot difficult you can't change your device for ev um, for um, maybe every release right so you will have another ios release happening in next month you will have um, hundreds of devices released into the market and will be more popular because everybody changes their devices now every year rather than every 3 years earlier so you can't keep up with the infrastructure uh, changes so that's why learning uh, to use the cloud based infrastructure is important learn what is ci cd what is devops what is devsecops and try to implement at least continuous testing at least put your test cases into ci cd infrastructure it is not very hard if you go to github or azure devops uh, you will have lot of online help on how to run your test cases in azure devops or through jenkins or through github actions so at least a qa um or a test engineer should know how to run his test cases automated test cases in ci cd that is the least thing that you can do to understand how ci cd works and then maybe you can learn sonar cube sonar cloud to um understand how to uh, create quality gates what are the different quality gates i can create to help my team understand if you don't have uh, if you don't uh, prove that you are worth in your team uh, you will be irrelevant um, for the future and then of course the last entrant or recent entrant is this uh, um, codeless testing tool you can uh, learn more about them you can learn rpa you can learn uh, record playback tools uh, if you cannot learn to code the least thing that you can do is learn the record playback rpa or codeless testing tools so to stay relevant and automate is what i'm uh, going to uh, advise you and this was our last slide um and then we are open for questions